G'day, it's episode 56 and I'm Jason Cartwright coming to you from Tech AU HQ here in Wodonga, Victoria. Nice of you to join me and lend me some of your time, I really appreciate that. And I'm going to reward you with some in-depth discussion about the technology stories over the last week or so. And to kick it off this week, we're going to talk about the NBN Internode pricing that was released this week. This is really the first retail pricing that we've seen. Up until today, we've really seen uh, trial prices, if you like, or introductory pricing for the NBN. So it's been pretty good value and something we've all you know, been incredibly enthused about. In reality, these retail deals is what's, what you're likely to expect to pay. Internode are really the first ISP to announce these, these prices. Uh, so expect more to come over the next following months and, and years as it gets rolled to your area. Prices are higher than expected and it shocked a lot of people. Basically, what we were sold on was higher speeds, uh, cheaper prices, and you would expect with those higher speeds, higher caps as well. In reality, what's happening is we've got caps between 30 to 30 gig to a one terabyte cap uh, and prices between $59 and $189.95. So... This is not really uh, close to what we were after. Uh, many of us pay less than this for ADSL2 right now. And yes, going to the NBM, we would get faster speeds. However, uh, we also wanted the benefit of either staying the same in pricing or getting cheaper. We certainly don't want to go in the other direction of paying more for internet. Uh, so the cheapest plan you can get is the bronze plan, and that's 12 meg down, 1 meg up. A lot of us on ADSL2 are already on much faster connections than that. That's $59.95 a month. The fastest platinum connection is 100 meg down, 40 meg up, and $189, as I said. That's for a one terabyte cap. Uh, look, that's that's pretty nuts. Nobody, no real consumer is going to pay that. I mean, there's a few exceptions, but on a whole, plans need to be sub $100 for ind either individuals or families to be able to afford um, you know, by the time you're paying for phone, like your mobile, as well as internet, maybe pay TV, you, you just, I mean, the monthly bills need to be manageable and um, paying over $100 for internet just seems a little crazy at this point. So uh, it's not delivering what we're after and Internode uh, got a fair bit of heat online uh, for these prices and then had to explain it. And uh, on the Internode blog, Simon Hackett posted and, and did explain the reason for the prices and he points the finger at the MBN code. He says that the 121 points of interconnect around the country basically will be charged at 40, 200 by $20 per megabit. So that equates to $4,000 per month because you have to buy a certain amount of megabits per month. And if you want to be a nationwide provider, which Internode, Telstra, Optus, those bigger ISPs, they all want to be uh, nationwide providers and they want to connect to every one of the 121 points of interconnect on the on the NBN. Uh, and so that's going to equate to around half a million dollars, almost half a million dollars for an ISP every month just to have connectivity to the NBN. So that's an awful lot of customers that you need on board to have a profitable business. That's crazy, to be honest. So I'm not faulting Internode for these prices. If that is the reality of it, um, that's pretty crazy. And they're just effectively covering costs. You've got cu customer acquisition costs, marketing, everything else that goes into an ISP on top of that. Uh, content, you know, a bunch of other uh, costs associated with it. So I'm not surprised by this. And ha go and take a look at Simon Hackett's blog post on Internode. It really does explain it in a lot of detail. Some of it might be a little over your head, but uh, if you are confused by the pricing, go and read it and it might give you some understanding. They certainly don't you know, come out and say, look, the NBN is awesome. Here's the best prices, blah, blah, blah. If they did, um, I think everybody would jump on board very quickly and be sold on the idea. If it was faster and cheaper, there's no real downside. But with it being only faster and not cheaper there's a decision there that really needs to be made. Now, obviously, Big Pond customers with the Telstra deal announced uh, a month or so ago still needs to be approved by Telstra shareholders. Um, 
Big Pond subscribers won't have a choice. They'll be transitioned over anyway. What price that will be at and what deal you end up on is still to be decided and obviously dependent on when your area gets rolled. So let's stay tuned for that. But that's the first story of the week. Moving on, I want to talk to you about a great sponsor of the podcast. This is the One More Thing Conference. It's happening in Melbourne on the 13th of August. So in just a couple of weeks, guys, One More Thing is a conference that is created by Anthony Ages, the guy who started Mac Talk and has since sold Mac Talk. But uh, all you iOS developers out there, you should jump over to onemorething.com. Check out the uh, .com.au, by the way. Check out the speaker lineup. These are guys who have been there and done that. So Matt Comey from Big Bucket Software, uh, guys like Russell Ivanovic from Shift Jelly, and uh, James Cooter from Savage Interactive. These are guys who have been there and done that and know what it takes to get an application to be successful in the iOS app store. Maybe they're going to highlight some pitfalls so you don't have to make the same mistakes, but uh, definitely check it out. It's happening in Melbourne, so if you're in Melbourne or can travel to Melbourne on the 13th of August, go there, check it out, register now. Tickets are $249, which I think is going to be a bargain for the amount of information you're going to get out of a out of a conference like this. That's one more thing, and thanks very much for sponsoring the podcast. Right, next up, next story, let's talk about Apple News. Because Apple have been huge this week in the news. And that's because not only did they announce massive, massive breakthrough earnings every quarter, it seems they they break expectations. Sales of the iPads, uh, Mac hardware, iPhones, you name it. They're just smashing all the records. It's, it's ridiculous how successful they're being. Uh, but it's clear that, uh, you know, they're doing really well in the new uh, iOS-driven uh, marketplace if you like so what we've seen this week also was the white macbook the entry-level macbook discontinued so you'll no longer be able to to get that white macbook and frankly it was pretty crappy <clears throat> most people if you could fork out the ec- extra cash you would get one of these aluminium uh, macbooks which are freaking awesome build quality uh i do want one of the new airs they are awesome uh the new airs well, maybe even the old airs, I, I, I'm not sure. Somebody on Twitter posted uh, the, the old airs had the res as well. But to have 1440 by 900 resolution on a 13-inch MacBook is just ideal, especially when you're doing development. Uh, whether you're working in Xcode and you've got a bunch of different windows, you normally probably get a, you know, with a 128800 display, you really need an external display to, to fit all that content on. Uh, or if you're using Bootcamp and you're you know, running something like Visual Studio or Photoshop or you know, something with a lot of tool palettes, you need some design area. Uh, high res really helps with that. And the 13-inch form factor, I think, is just perfect. You can still fit it on a plane. Um, you know, In most scenarios, it's, it's just big enough but not too big. So uh, I don't want to go up to the 15-inch. I think that, that that's just too big. So 13 is perfect with a high resolution. So... They've also got the Core i5, i7 processors, SSDs, um, ditching the optical drives, and also the the Mac minis, they ditch the optical drive as well. So you can, of course, buy an external USB connected optical drive, but um, I think it's clear we're moving away from optical media and, um, you know, Certainly, a lot of a lot of people are replacing the optical drives in their machines with an extra SSD, uh, make the machine super fast, get a bit of extra life out of it, um, or you could upgrade. OS X Lion came out as well, only available through the App Store right now uh, to be available on a USB drive in apps in Apple stores later this year, uh, around August uh, August Augustish for that. Um, but if you're on Snow Leopard, just go to the App Store, search Lion, $31.99 Australian, which is only a couple of bucks over the US price. And of course, we've got GST. Um, so let's talk about Lion and, and my Lion experience because I did upgrade, obviously, to, to bring the latest news to you guys. <clears throat> Lion is an upgrade. It's, as the price indicates, it's not a groundbreaking refresh of Mac OS. 
Uh, it's 10.7. So, um, yeah, it's a point release basically. So, full screen applications were introduced. Been on Windows for a long time. Um, they're, they're introduced but not supported across the board. So, um, some... Some applications support it, basically some don't. When they don't, you just get the typical maximize with the uh, Mac title bar at the top and you dock at the bottom. If they're a full screen application, they do take up full screen and you just get to focus on that. What I'm looking at right now is Safari maximized with the show notes in and uh, the browser works fantastic in full screen. Just uses all the screen real estate. You don't lose 50 pixels at the top and 100 at the bottom or whatever. So uh, you get a lot more space. Uh, multi-touch gestures is another one, obviously borrowing heavily from what's happening on iOS. And uh, you can swipe with uh, three fingers left or right to switch between applications. Um, so if you do have full screen applications, it's easy to do that. You can swipe up and you get this uh, what called like uh, mission control view. It shows you all in one screen, all the applications that are uh, running and uh, easily switch between them. And uh, what's the other launch pad? So if you use five fingers and uh, basically like pinch like that with five fingers, you get uh, almost the iPad's icon layout on your desktop. I'm surprised they didn't go with this as just your desktop icons now have, have these applications on them. Like iOS, you switch on your iPad and the apps are just there. Um, maybe they'll change that in a future release, but it supports folders. Um, this is your new way of really accessing applications. You do still have the applications folder in your dock or, you know, um, just by searching, but, uh, you know, using using search, I guess, is going away. Um, you know, they, they prefer you rather than your spotlight just to, to use that gesture, bring up your apps, select one, and then you're away and racing. Um, Another huge change, or not massive, I guess, but it certainly created a lot of controversy online, is the decision to invert the scrolling. So when you're in a document, uh, and I never really thought about this consciously, I guess, but you actually scroll the your opposite way when you're on the iPad. You know, you you're dragging down to go down, I guess, and um, you know, up to go up, or if you like. Or so they've they've flipped that around, and now like if you go up. It actually moves the page up, uh, so you're really scrolling down. If you, it's a little hard to to understand, I guess, if you're just um, hearing this in, on the audio. But um, yeah, it's it's basically mirrors what what happens on iOS now. So uh, you can disable it. And a lot of people have gone down that path. Uh, I've lived with it for a couple of days now, and it does. You know, you you do get used to it. It's just sort of a bit of a mental switch. Going between Windows and Mac then becomes a lot harder because you do have that mental adjustment to make when you're scrolling. Um, the downsides, I guess, of, of upgrading to Line right now is that not all apps support it. Uh, I did have a couple die. Uh, let's have a look at apps. So I've got a couple of question marks in my dock. The Kindle app for Mac doesn't, doesn't come across and Windows Messenger. Um, I'm a huge Windows Live Messenger fan on Windows. So I used to run... Windows Messenger on the Mac, just have that same contact list. I know there's third-party apps I could use. It's just something you need to be aware of. Not all your apps will come across. There's refreshes in Mail and Calendar and a bunch of different core apps to, to Apple OS. So check them out. The I Love Suite's still the same. Um, yeah, that's that's basically... Oh, one thing I did want to point out is I do run Boot Camp on this and it hosed my Boot Camp partition. So... Uh, yeah, that kind of sucks. So just be careful. Make sure you back up if you are running a boot camp on your Mac. I've heard some people's worked okay and other people confirm my my experience that um, that it does kill it. So yeah, there's no warning or anything that you're going to have an issue with this. It's just it dies. So back up. Um, unfortunately, I guess that I didn't have anything crucial sitting on there that wasn't somewhere else. So I'm not completely heartbroken but uh it does take a while as you'd know half a day to get your system back up and running if you have to rebuild it that's enough on apple let's move on next story this week is manor bar melbourne is now open i went down to melbourne drove four hours there or four hours back for half an hour inside 
And yes, that seems insane, but I think it was worth it. It was all about the people and, you know, my mates from Top Geek, Skadris and, and Andy were there. Talk to them in the line and, you know, the people around you, these are people who have similar interests and you can get to know them. You get inside and, uh, you know, you've all been there, lined up for four hours. Uh, you've been there in the sunshine, in the cold, and uh, you get inside and you have a drink and you have a game and it all goes away. You're just enjoying yourself. So it's a relatively small place. I will give you that warning. So don't go there with a, with a uh, friend group of 100 if you're that way inclined. But uh, look, if you've got a few mates and you're down near Fitzroy Way, go check it out. Those guys who run it are awesome. They've obviously put in a lot of work and a lot of money to get it up and running. Uh, there was a line down the block for pretty much all the day and uh, hundreds of people went through that day and uh, awesome photos. Go and check out my Flickr, flickr.com slash techau. Those people who follow me on Facebook, they've probably already seen and tagged themselves in the photos, which is awesome. Um, people I never introduced myself to on the day have since tagged themselves in the photos and then we become friends on Facebook. So that's, you know, I'll get to the next story in a second, Google Plus, but that's a huge win for Google, a huge win for Facebook. A really, uh, it's a it's a great experience to do that, and a great way to meet people, just by you know photos. So, let's talk about Google Plus because it's been a few weeks now since Google Plus first launched. Maybe you still don't have an invite, but if you haven't, well, you're doing it wrong. Um, plenty of people have invites invites now. Uh, it seems Google servers are a little happier and, and can manage the invite queue. So, uh, you know, they confirmed in just over a week, they put on 10 million users, which really highlights the power of Google. You know, initially there was a lot of conversation around whether this was going to be here long term, if it was going to be another failure like Buzz or Wave. Um, you know, Google can't really do social was a sort of the tagline. Now we're we're a couple of weeks on from that. Now they're pushing towards 20 million users. Um, it's clear that Google has committed to this in a way that we haven't seen them commit to a project for a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Simply by the black bar that is across the top of all the Google properties now. Um, not all have had the refresh of the UI, but you know, mail, calendar. Uh, news is on the way. Send some screenshots today. News is going to get redone. Um, Reader, you you can imagine, can't be far away. That just really lends itself to being shared on Google Reader. YouTube is, uh, I'm in like an alpha slash beta uh, preview of the new YouTube and that's kind of cool. Um, so sharing between the Google properties and Google Plus is a really going to gonna be a really strong uh, compliment, I guess, and, and something easy to do. There tends to be, or my uh, my experience with Google Plus is that it tends to be the very tech oriented crowd in there right now. I haven't come across regular people in there just yet, and maybe that is that threshold of when you cross 10 million to 100 million, that's when that thing starts to happen, when it starts to go more mainstream. Now, getting mainstream people like my mum is probably never going to join Google+. Plus. She just doesn't have a need for it. Facebook services all the need that she has. However, those of us in, in the tech crowd who do enjoy Google services, it's going to be great to see Google push Facebook and go head-to-head -head with features. Certainly, by, by far, Hangouts is the most interesting feature that Google Plus has right now. Nobody else is offering 10-person video for free. That's just not done anywhere else. There's multi you know, multi-people video chat and Skype if you pay for it. Uvu offers it as well and a bunch of others, but nobody is doing 10-person video chat for free. What I'd like to see Google do is tweak the layout of that so you can have two or three people side by side or grid of the people in there. So maybe the Brady Bunch style grid of, of video windows rather than just the, the main primary window and then the 10 uh, in a row down the bottom. So I think they can play a lot with those... Uh, with the UI there and give different uh, display uh, options. There's no advertising right now. You know that's coming because that's Google's strength. That's how they make money. Um, so it's got the beta tag on right now, but eventually it's going to have to be paid for. And uh, yeah, just a matter of time. 
but going well and uh, I'm going to stick with it. I just check in every now and then. Facebook is still an every day, multiple times a day sort of service for me. Google Plus is sort of once or twice a day. Um, yeah, and make sure you block Robert Scoble because he's just ridiculous. Uh, anyway, Australia has finally taken a step forward in the movement to get an R18 plus game rating in Australia. That is fantastic. Awesome news out today. And uh, this isn't by any means official R18 rating. It's not going to be put on games tomorrow and games start shipping with it. Uh, it is a in-place agreement. So in principle agreement to say, look, as a general principle of having this adult rating for games, we approve. And all the states... Bar New South Wales have got on board with this. A little crazy, but um, yeah, obviously the New South Wales people are a little hesitant or a little reserved, I guess. Uh, maybe there's some people in there that are campaigning pretty hardly against it, some religious groups perhaps. Uh, I don't know the reasons for that, but uh, you'd have to think if the majority of Australia wants it, it's going to happen. And what we definitely wouldn't want to have is a game can come out in Victoria and Queensland, but not in New South Wales. That would be insane. So hopefully majority rules. People have spoken. We want this. And um, interesting subline to that, I guess, is that they haven't said, you know, every game that gets uh, applied for will get a, get a rating. And if it's a, an adult orientated thing, it's just automatically R18. They definitely reserve the right to still refuse games classification. So it's not an open slather that everything will get in. But what it does do is open up the opportunity to rate a game between 15 plus and 18 plus. So if it is advanced violence or themes, you know, adult themes, like it does have some sort of drug references in, um, maybe murderous stuff um, that's not appropriate for 15 year olds, uh, then yeah, 18 plus could be appropriate. So anyway, it's definitely moving in the right direction and good on everybody who voted for that uh, in the online petitions. It seems now to have worked and uh, people are listening. So awesome news for us and uh, look forward to more news on that in the future. But that's going to wrap it up for this episode and I hope you've enjoyed it. This has been TechAU episode 56. I'm Jason Cartwright. Check out the site techau.tv. Throw us an email, comment, question, anything you like, jason at techau.tv. And uh, hit us up on Twitter, at TechAU, or on Facebook, slash TechAU. And uh, I'll be in contact. Cheers, guys. Bye.